Test, Test. Coming through. Thank you. Hi, all. We'll give it a few more minutes before we get started in here. Liz, you made it. Yes. Greetings. Sorry, I was uh, having a little muting and unmuting issues there. So, Perfectly yeah. fine. No worries. I'm just giving everyone a few more minutes to be able to come on in. Hello, everyone. We have two regrets today, right? Tag today. Um, Dims, go ahead. Hi, Dims. Uh, we have two regrets today, right? So I... sad. Who was the other one, Dims? Uh, Justin, I think. It is perfectly fine. Um, we, we are not, to my knowledge, taking a vote in this meeting, so we should be fine on that. Thank you. Should we get started? Yeah, I think we can rock and roll. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Normal rules apply. And you made it. And Amy will update that. Right. Tag updates this week. We're we doing them in alphabetical order. <laughs> All right. Let's start with app delivery. Yeah. Hello, everyone. A uh, quick update from tag app delivery. On the project side, Crossplane is already submitted and I think waiting for final approval from the TUC. Depper is submitted as well for incubation. I think they are right. I don't know whether the interviews already happened on Depper, but the recommendation and due diligence from the tech app delivery site is done. The Captain project also presented for incubation in the SIG, but is waiting for um, to get a sponsor from, from the TOC right now. But most of their work is done and they're also waiting. Uh, who is the TOC sponsor for Dapper? I'll let you know. I think it's Dims, but I might be wrong. Um, hey, that's news to me. <laughs> ah, Stanis Lee, sorry, it's, it's Harry. He's saying Harry, Harry is the sponsor, so. You were sponsoring another one. So it was just, it was a couple of projects, so that, but we have you here, so you could clarify that one. Um, yeah, on the deliverable side, the chaos engineering white paper is uh, slowly moving um, along here. Uh, we're also still working on the charter for the working group, so the team has started to work on that one. Our demo a project from the, the Potato Pet project for showcasing all the app delivery projects within and beyond the CNCF. 
um, gain uh, more momentum again. So currently the project, which used to be a single service, which is only of limited value, obviously to show distributed service updates has now been kindly updated to distributed services. And currently all the examples for all CNCF projects are getting updated as well. This also helps the work which we are then um, doing on the cooperative delivery use cases, where we're then using the examples to provision on the one at the application and the underlying infrastructure with uh, all the CNCF projects that are out there. Uh, on the working groups, the cooperative delivery working groups are the working group that specifically deals with how app delivery, infrastructure delivery, and the processes in between fit um, together has the draft charter available under the link here. Uh, we also sent it to the TUC mailing list to get the approval. Some of you have already voted, some have not yet voted. So if you have any questions, please let us know. And if you have not voted yet, it would be great to get um, your vote. And on the chaos engineering side, it is still a work in uh, progress, so that yeah, we should have the working group charter finished rather sooner than later as well. So that's it from app delivery. Any questions? Luis, um, question, the cooperative delivery working group, mm -hmm. is, that, is that one in the same, is that formally known as the GitOps working group? No, that's not the GitOps working group. That's the one that deals with the problem that app and infrastructure delivery are often um, disconnected and you have to have a lot of handovers, a lot of dependencies. Oh, I see, gotcha, okay. Plus having that situation that in many Kubernetes use cases, some cluster is also provisioning the underlying infrastructure and there are dependencies and requirements. So it was mostly driven by folks working on the infrastructure side and problems that ran with on the app side. Again, this is the best name we could come up for. There is still a contest out there for a better voting, which just came up with cooperative because like really bringing infrastructure and app ops together and ensuring that something you actually write in your YAML files on the application side can later on be deployed on the infrastructure because storage classes are supported, networks are supported. And if not, you can check it actually before deploying it. Um, instead of having it in some cases fail silently or not, not, not work at all. So that, that's what they're dealing with. Again, naming is hard as Liz pointed out, um, but at least everybody remembers it because nobody remains to think of it twice what it's doing, but that, that's what it's, uh, what it's about. I think eventually there's also for uh, SIG network things that's come into play like with blue green deployments and things like this when we start to work on this. Um, yeah, not to imply that the other working groups aren't cooperative. But uh, uh, and, um, one other question, if I might, um, do you have a sense of like how much of the focus of the working group is on the softer, the, the human side of things, like the softer side of there being an, an infra team and an apps team and, and, and how, how centralized YAML or a single file that describes concerns for both teams like, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is uh, how, how much of the focus is on soft, psychological, human, gooey, sticky things versus, uh, um, you know, binary uh, systems, software mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, obviously, at the end of the day, all uh, humans have to write those YAML files in most cases. But that's not the <laughs> no, I think it, 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 it's a combination of both. It's really the processes that these different teams have, like looking into different release cycles, the processes and how they work with, how they work and get things done out there. But the focus is still very much how can we produce artifacts and have processes that these artifacts eventually work together. So it, it's not like your agile type of approach for cloud natives. So we're not going like that far on, on the human and process side. It's all ensuring that what falls out at the end or what these independent teams are working on eventually fits uh, fits together. If at a later point in time, we come up with uh, something that's more related to, okay, this is how your team should work together, or this is what we have actually found people working together. We had a, a longer discussion also to not just obviously come up with the white paper by ideas that um, we have within the working group. Part of our work is also to talk to people and companies who are doing this already at scale and getting their best practices and how to make this work. So we, the plan is not to like reinvent the wheel, but it's really having a, a collection of uh, all of the good practices that are already available there. And if, if more 
process and organizational stuff will fall out. I think it will find its way to some document. But right now it's really about the hard technical issues that you might run into or that people used to run into by running Kubernetes-based workloads and having like this infrastructure and app uh, side of things. James, I think you had a question. James, you were very, very muted. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Much um, better. Okay, like, try it again. Yeah. So other than the white paper, the chaos engineering working group, what other kind of things um, are they thinking about for the future? Um, getting started guides, um, also best practices. So there's a lot of talks, but the, the white paper is like the bigger one, but also like how you get started, uh, which type of tests you could be running, giving people an overview. So the interesting thing here is on the chaos engineering working group, um, it, became evident very early on that this is not just something that's related to app delivery. <laughs> it's an activity that spans multiple working groups. So we immediately started obviously talk to networking because of um, network chaos, um, then to security, but security chaos. And obviously for doing all of those um, chaos related works, you also want to know whether the system actually can deal with the chaos or not, which then directly brings you to observability as well. So I think there's also a lot of work that site brings all those people uh, together, which is also why it takes a bit longer, like to get the working group uh, like formed because it's a lot of people that are involved in there, but people very actively from the different teams take part in it. Awesome, nice to hear. Thank you. To what extent is cooperative delivery? related to what people might describe as a platform team? I think it's the combination of a platform and an app team working together so that it like kind of really works, works pretty well. So the people we have in there are those that are used to be on both sides, like the ones building the app applications and the ones building the platform. And it's a lot of the things that usually don't go well together when this happens in independent teams. There, is, there are a couple of examples in the in, in the chart there in there, like for example, you use people assume that it because in their dev environment they have storage classes available that suddenly are not available in a production environment, or a certain version of an application requires certain infrastructure components all the way down to cloud resources to be provisioned, which are usually not part of the application definition, but of the platform definition. But you still have this dependency in your application code in there. So how you can model these kind of things, it's especially as people start to use the tooling. But what kind of became obvious, we have tools pretty much for everything and we can do everything in Kubernetes. So we can even use Kubernetes um, and CRD and various projects that are out there like uh, uh, AKD to even provision cloud resources. But it's, it's almost like there's the infrastructure and to some extent platform side, and then there's the application side. But there's like no common view of like bringing both together and ensuring that they're uh, working together nicely. I hope I made that point clear. Any other questions for Alice and Tag App Delivery? Okay, thank you very much. Is it network next? Network, all right. Um, we have a new co-chair. Uh, Ed Warnicky, uh, yay! <laughs> I can see there's uh, yes, yes. This has been a long time coming. Good, Ed. Um, so many of you um, gave some positive plus ones to the suggestion that Ed would, would come in. He he's uh, uh, we stand to breathe some new life uh, into the what um, Sig Network is doing, and hopefully, I'm um, deliver on part of the the charter of well, geez, I just said Sig Network, but of uh, what Tag Network is doing. And uh, boy, what's worse is that some of you didn't catch it. I think that's even worse. Um, and, and make sure that we're uh, on a rotational basis inviting in uh, various projects within the Tag, also various working groups within uh, Kubernetes to have a form of exchange. We're just, uh, there's a lot that goes on between the projects and not everyone always has time to exchange some of those thoughts and things. So um, particular to networking, there's 
there's a fair bit, there's a fair bit going on. There's, um, so anyway, that's part of the charter is to, and we, we haven't done um, a whole lot of that and that's primarily based on bandwidth. Um, so welcome, Ed. The uh, last couple of calls that TAG Network has had have been light on project reviews, light on uh, business, if you will, for TAG Network, although Cilium uh, and Chaos Smash are both um, up for um, incubation and both, uh, at least Cilium for sure is out for voting. And I think Chaos Mesh is a little bit earlier in the process. Um, the, what, what, the, what we have been able to spend time on is in the Service Mesh Working Group, there's, I guess, a couple of thing, items highlighted. So um, under the Service Mesh Performance uh, Group, the folks at Intel, a couple of folks at Intel, Red Hat and, and Layer 5 have, uh, in coordination with Ken Owens, um, drafted a publication for IEEE. If you're interested in that sort of thing, there's a, there's a link to the um, final draft um, that talks about the approaches to performance uh, measurement um, in context of a service mesh. So next item up was the one of the programs, one of the initiatives inside of that the service mesh working group is that of SMI conformance. And so Oh, since last we've met here, both uh, open service mesh is a, a merge away from reporting their conformance on a release by release basis. So, so that, that's great. They're kind of getting into, into the system um, by which they would automatically report conformance. Nginx service mesh had um, been joining the calls most recently and is also now um, manually reporting their conformance, but um, so that's great. The last item, the last highlighted item here is oh, just on the topic of service mesh patterns and identifying best practices for various you know, pieces of functionality that service meshes offer, characterizing those into a service mesh agnostic pattern. Um, so there's a, a, some of that effort will fruit or will be demonstrated at service mesh con. So that's uh, nice for those that have been working on the, the patterns. And that's, that's the update. Uh, Lee, um, quick question. Uh, uh, what is the overlap or um, you know, how do you work with the, say the CNF working group? Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. Um, so by the way, is the CNF working group under any tag? Um, That's why I was asking. <laughs> yeah. I think it's part of the telco user group, isn't it? Yeah, or it is the genesis of, well, or, or a slight point of confusion, my best. So this is grain of salt. This is my best understanding is that yep, the fine folks that have been working in the TUG or in the telco, telco user group had wanted to of, you know, formalize in advance uh, a component of what they discuss or what, like the, 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 I think primarily like testing and um, analyzing a performance of cloud native network functions and, and hence the working group CNF um, working group and had kind of a little while ago looked, been, had proposed that working group looked for a home sort of between um, app delivery, uh, ta tag app delivery and tag network and and became established. I don't know that they necessarily hang out in one of the two groups uh, per se. Um, the good that's on the maybe the softer side of sort of organizationally. The I'm talking about a lot of gooey and, and hard things today. I don't know why, but anyway, on the harder, more technical side, um, there is. Well, I, I think the genesis of that working group having come from the telco user group or tug uh, should is an indication should indicate like that yeah a lot of the there's a distinction in they are service mesh provider i'm sorry geez, service mesh they're service provider focused um a more like so so vnfs and cnfs are of that of that genre of networking if you will which is touches up against, but is distinct. It's it's nuanced, very nuanced, but it's distinct from 
some of the uh, more enterprise-centric use cases of how some of the other uh, projects are used. So uh, it, it like is uses a lot of the same network words, um, but the folks that are interested or the use cases and, and those that are involved are um, it end up being um, highly, highly related, highly, uh, uh, like if you take a look at the performance tests that are being done in the CNF working group and those that are being done in like the service mesh performance project, um, maybe they'll meet on 5G or like, uh, but right now the, the, the type of applications and the type of network functions that are being analyzed are they're running in different environments under different, like, um, and they're, they're hence using different um, test harnesses and... Um, yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, thanks for the detail, um, you know, how everybody is related to each other. The reason for asking this question is like, in the end, they use all the projects that come from like, you know, under the tag network. Uh, so if there is a good feedback loop between the tag network and the CNF, it will be beneficial. Is, is my feeling, uh, you know, if they are on their own, not like getting things back to us, then, you know, we are missing an opportunity, I feel. I, I, I don't, I um, had expressed a similar opinion previously. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't, not, yeah, uh, yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah. I think I know from the, early days of it being set up the the user group were very keen on having those discussions without vendors present and i guess that's why it's a separate group that's separate from you know tsc because tsc groups don't have restrictions on you know they're open to anybody um so i guess that may be historically why it's in that user group side but i completely agree if there was like overlap between personnel who were involved in that user group and in tag network that would be really useful i just point a quick clarification just and i don't know if there is a there's i think you know there's sort of three inter three groups here the end user service mesh working group which you, to liz's point is vendor free um actually they had reached i actually just presented at their last meeting they were really curious about some of the projects that are going on here and, and and so yeah, vendor free, the the service mesh working group here, vendored, but then the CNF working group, I think is what Dims is, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Any other questions about Tag Network? Okie doke, my alphabetic skills have failed me. Observability, hello. <laughs> hello. I don't think we have Alita here. At least she wasn't here earlier. Are you here? No. Um, so yeah, um, we also have a third co-chair now, Alita Sharma of AWS. Um, she was suggested and devoted in last month, but she's not here to say hi, but she's in. <laughs> Also, I think Matt had a few points. Uh, also, we had a break in August. Um, over to you, Matt, for, for the rest. I think you put that in. Uh, yeah, the, the third one there should be gone. I think I, I timed it wrong when when, when the meeting started. Uh, that, that That's that's for the future. Um, <clears throat> as Richie said, we're coming back from August break. We've got a new co-chair. We're very excited about that. Um, Alalita joins us uh, and brings uh, quite a bit of domain expertise, as well as uh, vision and, and experience building uh, communities. So, so we're extremely uh, uh, psyched uh, and enthusiastic about that. Um, we have uh, our first meeting uh, in an hour, just after this, uh, and we'll be revisiting where we were back in uh, July. So we have a number of work streams, uh, everything from the YouTube channel, uh, which I think we can do a lot more with, um, as well as uh, we're going to be looking to recruit additional tech leads uh, this fall. Uh, so if, if anyone has recommendations or referrals, uh, please pass them along uh, to one of the co-chairs. Uh, uh, and um, that's pretty much it. We'll keep it short and sweet today. 
Um, we're looking forward to, I guess, Q4, fall, however you want to uh, uh, place it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other questions for observability folks? All right. What's next? Runtime. Do we have anyone from Runtime here? Yeah. Oh, hey, Ricardo. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so some quick updates for Tag Runtime. Um, we had some presentations uh, in, in our meeting. So uh, in the containers and runtime space, uh, we had this presentation for confidential containers. Uh, the folks are working on confidential computing. Uh, they have this new project and they're thinking about applying for Sandbox. This is uh, a project backed by a lot of uh, big companies, Intel, Apple, Red Hat, IBM, AMD. So a lot of, a lot of backing from this project. So this is a way to run, uh, you know, like, workloads that are fully protected in uh, cloud uh, service providers. Uh, so places where you don't own the hardware. So people are able to run uh, the, the workloads in, in a secure way and being verified, being encrypted and all the, all the good stuff with, with security. Uh, so in the machine learning, uh, machine learning edge, uh, artificial intelligence space. So, we had um, a presentation from Volcano. Uh, this is um, a project that allows you to run batch workloads on top of Kubernetes. The presentation is about incubation. So they're trying to go for incubation and they're looking for a sponsor, a TOC sponsor. So if anyone interested in sponsoring um, to take this project forward, uh, it, it tackles an area uh, that um, there's a, well, there's a gap, you know, in terms of batch work, workloads for Kubernetes. Another project uh, we had a presentation from was um, MLflow. It, this this is end-to-end -end machine learning, and uh, it's a really big project. It's similar to Kubeflow, uh, so um, very a very um, large community. So hopefully we get some uh, interest. Uh, from those folks to you know to participate more in the CNCF activities. KubeDL is another project uh, in Sandbox in the CNCF, and uh, it allows you to run deep learning uh, workloads. So so taking the, your model from training to production. So it's currently in Sandbox. So uh, they're looking to grow and possibly go into incubation sometime in the future. And finally, in this space that uh, we reached out to the MLOps community. So we're asking for more uh, participation to, so that we have more uh, in this space, you know, uh, projects that are interested in, in, in presenting in our meetings. And for uh, tag runtime activities, we're still, uh, working on a logo, so that's in progress. Uh, hopefully we'll have that ready in the next few weeks. In the Container Orchestrated Device Working Group, um, uh, Renault, which was the ch main chair of the um, working group, uh, stepped down. So Alex Konevsky from Intel will be handling most of the activities. And we have some interest from the confidential containers uh, community that possibly they want to create a working group, but that's in progress. So uh, that may come after they apply for Sandbox. And finally, for KubeCon North America uh, in China, we have uh, uh, tag sessions, tag runtime sessions. So uh, we want to get more um, exposure and, and hopefully get more people involved. Uh, and the, the one in North America is going to be an in-person session. And yeah, that's, that, that's all for the updates. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, one, sorry, go, go ahead, Les. 
I was just curious if there's an overlap between confidential containers and CATA containers. That... Yeah, so it's this, it's the same community, uh, but they, CATA containers could be one of the components that they, they can use, but they, they can use other runtimes, other uh, VM type of runtimes. So there's also proposed lift K run, I think that, that will actually make it possible to run uh, confidential containers. So, so yeah, so it's, uh, there's, there's some overlap and, and uh, in a way, uh, but it's not exactly the same. So. Okay. Yeah, they, they are actually, the Kata container folks are using container D and there is a POC in container D as well, where they're experimenting on some of this uh, stuff. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the one question I had, Ricardo, is uh, Wasm folks, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's a bunch of Wasm projects under uh, in Tagrant time. Uh, how are they working with each other or how are they cooperating? Um, is there any, anything going on where uh, yeah, the Wasm related folks are talking to each other? Yeah, we've, we've had a few projects present. So uh, in the last one was uh, Wasm Cloud, uh, Liam Randall is the lead for, for that project. And um, they, he actually set up the, the Cloud Wasm Day um, uh, event at the KubeCon. So I, I, he's actually in contact with some of those folks, but um, we, I think it would be a good idea to maybe uh, uh, reach out to them and see if there's something that we can do in terms of like creating a working group. Uh, but yeah, we 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 didn't we don't have a lot of a, a base for Wasm this time, but we, we've actually done quite a bit in the past. Um, but going forward, I think a good idea would be to create some sort of working group so they they actually work together. Uh, but uh, Liam working on Wasm Cloud has actually started with the, you know, the Wasm uh, Cloud Wasm Day event and, and the idea there is also to get more participation from the community and, and, and more traction in, in some of those projects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, unless there are any other questions about runtime. Thank you. Let's go to security. Hey, hey. So we have just one update, but it's a big update. We finally brought to completion the assessment of cloud native built packs. This has been going on for quite some time since April of last year. Extremely high praise for the diligence and rigor from the maintainers of cloud native build packs and how responsive they were throughout the whole process, entire length. And they were absolutely prompt uh, to resolve any questions, respond to any feedback that the, assess uh, that the assessors had for them. Couple, couple notable things, while well, the, the project is, is watertight, uh, Two different dimensions. One is well the the outputs of build packs, the container images that are generated using build packs tooling, uh, do a lot of assurance to uh, abide by container security best practices. Examples are all processes must use uh, non uh, root user or group identifiers at build time, and uh, generation built and run images are, are done separately. All variables are, are specified separately. If reproducibility is supported, uh, build pack does ensure bit by bit uh, reproducibility of, of these artifacts. Then the, the other layer is uh, how well the, the project follows uh, secure development best practices. Uh, while we're doing the assessment, we're able to do the CII best practices for the project. And it was just a breeze filling, all, filling out all the security criteria because they were meeting it already. Uh, notably, in addition to that, the project team also started signing their lifecycle images using cosign 
and generating Cyclone DX S bombs for, for their releases. So uh, all in all, uh, really good assessment. Uh, we're about to merge it soon. We're playing a little bit with the Google Docs API to export all resolved comments. So people get more visibility and transparency into what were they assessed against? What was the kind of feedback? How did they respond to it? They did put a lot of effort in and rewarding this, the assessment itself so the questions wouldn't arise in, in first place. So the assessment document as it stands should be a good enough reference. With that, the, the recommendation to CNCF is uh, to circulate that assessment as a vehicle to improve awareness of, of the project and how it compares and contrasts uh, to ecosystem alternatives when it comes to security properties. Uh, that's it for the assessment, some administrative stuff regarding assessments. Uh, we were a little bit backtracked uh, with other assessments that, that were in the, in the pipeline ahead of this one. Uh, also that the project uh, due diligence for incubation uh, bypassed the security assessment uh kind of influence that we didn't have a really strong sense of urgency to to knock this one out uh from the get-go and it kind of became victim to other priorities so yeah determining whether assessments are, are mandatory for due diligences would would help us uh triage and prioritize these better and then with well it's been it's been a hard year for everyone so lots of job changes lots of people taking leave and that that also affected a little bit of the length of of the whole assessment but well once again um should be should be checked in pretty soon uh we'll send an update to the group once it is happy to take any questions if there are any i feel like i have questions about build packs <laughs> i don't know if you're the best person to to answer them it could people no way, today, I can try. Could people today just be swapping out their existing images built with typically Docker build and just replacing them with build packs and the world would be a safer place? My understanding is yes, there's almost zero uh, heavy lifting involved and it's quite swappable as, as you've said. Uh, I also have Matthew Giassa, who was involved in, in the assessment. Matthew, I don't know if, if you can speak in more detail to that, else we'll just defer it to the, to the project team and come back with a response. Don't actually see him here, I think. He might have just dropped. Okay. Let me, let me take it a, as an AI, but yeah, I think that's, that's going to be the the question in people's minds like yeah. well, we, you know can can people use their existing registry and just be storing build packs in the same registry and you know like what's the process for people to move to build packs okay they Perfect. may already have that documented somewhere but that's that's my kind of um initial reaction to that recommendation is okay if, if it's easy for people to to make this change let's let's encourage it but i think we need to understand what that process of making the change involves. Fair. One, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is that um, in practice, the build packs are, are most often um, maintained by the platform team, which is one of the ways that things get more secure is because you've got a platform team who often take on the responsibilities for security in an organization maintaining these build packs, essentially maintaining the image building process. And then we have app teams that just use them. I think that what's so interesting is the parallel to the conversation that Alois was talking about earlier when he was talking about YAML and platform teams and app teams. There's, there's a crossover, from, there, there's a relationship to what we're talking about here with build packs. So build packs are a very specific technique that I think addresses that coordination 
and that cooperation between the platform team. I love how you called that out earlier, Liz, that you were saying, isn't this platform, platform team, app team, it's that cooperation. And so build packs are part of that cooperation as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Alois, if you're still here, I'd, I'd love to hear your reaction to, to this. Yeah, I think it is it is one of the projects that we listed as well as, as one of those that should be be in there. I think because I think it also solves a lot of the supply chain security concerns as well using using build packs. Uh, I think there's still the unresolved issue is what about like all the other YAML configurations that uh, go beyond just the container image. And we have seen some projects that have interesting approaches there as well. Conceptually very similar, like you can't use the pure YAML any, anymore, you just get access to uh, value files for more or less predefined templates. I think there's also some interesting developments there in where people build these higher level components in Kubernetes. Like you can say, I have a service and I want to have it exposed to the, to the internet. And this is where my image is coming from. This is my URL, just parameters. Like this, a non-CNCF project we were, uh, for example, talking to was Gimlet, a very small but interesting project. Um, but very well received and also by those platform teams because they can say, well, what I, you, you can build whatever you want to, dear application developer, but this is what it's supposed to look like. These are the network policies you need to have. These are the network routes. These are the, the, this is the security roles that need to be there. Um, so I, I think the a similar concept uh, exists exist as well. That's not yet part of build packs, but, but build packs fit in there as well. But that other area will also be one, I think, where we'll see more more and more people um, working in the direction because conceptually that's what build packs do. They more or less let you just keep the application specific parts and the rest is injected underneath and also updated automatically. And, and similar things for um, configuration um, artifacts like whether it's YAML, um, pure YAML or Helm charts, I think we will see more of, the, of that as well from a simplicity and a security perspective. So um, that, that's exactly the direction which, which, which we're looking into as well. I think there's also an overlap with the uh, runtime with some of the, the confidential computing containers. You know, part of the work that they're doing is actually, you know, pulling out like an encrypted image or encrypted uh, workload uh, artifact uh, and making it run in a secure way. So there's, there's overlap with app delivery, runtime and security there and possibly storage too, you know, how you store securely store your, your containers, right? So it's kind of like, it's, it's a very interesting space. Yeah, um, I, I, I feel quite ignorant about what the kind of process is here for people who want to move to, to build packs, what that involves. I think that could be a really interesting thing to understand because well, it sounds like build packs are a good thing and solve some problems, particularly for security. So uh, yeah. You know, for, for fairness to, to the assessment authors who handed it us to have it scrutinized, they did detail that in the document. But being security folks, we, we've just zoomed in into the security design. Uh, I would encourage folks just to click on the link, flip through it. They do a great job writing up like the intended use. And as Cornelio was saying, they do highlight very well like the shared responsibilities model and how like platform and app teams are meant to cooperate through build packs and like what responsibility falls on on whose side uh so they do have quite a bit of, of that in writing and, and like these assessments are are great for that purpose to to give people like a a quick deep dive on on certain practical things of of the project so just wanted to bring that up because they did write it so a uh, quick question here, keying off of what Liz was saying um, and what is uh, in the text uh, that is being presented. So the assessment team strongly suggests elevating awareness of the project, right? So what tools do we have in CNCF uh, that we can help make this happen, I guess? Because if CN, uh, if we, you know, we were talking about like, okay, people need to move from Docker to CNAB and 
that will be better for security, right? Like, how do we get the word out? Yeah, of of the services provided to to projects, depending on on the tier they're in, uh, there are a number of like information dissemination or like marketing opportunities, be it webinars, be it social media, be it well. Let's let's take from this assessment the those parts that we're we're talking about of like, hey, how how do you migrate from this to that, and why would you in the first place like writing up the value prop like really crisp and really succinct so it's not like a, a 10 or 12 page document i think can can go a long ways uh these are just ideas and i'm, I'm spitballing here because i hadn't anticipated that question and it's something throughout assessments we find in the summer we always suggest like hey let's do a little bit more marketing for for this uh, project that might be like an expert level system and not like the rest of the ecosystem's not aware uh, for any number of reasons. Yeah, I, oh. I could really imagine, you know, maybe the, the project, you know, writing some material to help on this. But also if we had like end users who had actually done that transition and could share how that had gone, I could see that being really valuable. And I guess the Bill Packs project is probably the people who are best placed to know who's done it. So I hope we can put that into their court, but you know, with support from CNCF that we, because from everything I'm hearing, this sounds very positive. And it probably involves things like, you know, how do we get people to use examples that use build packs instead of Docker files? And how do we get people to, you know, just as they're talking about delivering applications, you know, how do we make the default choice the more modern choice? Yeah, that's I remember from the due diligence review, and I don't want to do them wrong. It might have changed in the between. I think they could put a bit more into especially the examples, because I know when I was reviewing it, they had the examples, but they were not necessarily the most useful ones if you would just wanted to build your container. But that, that might have changed been changed since the due diligence. But I, I agree. I think this is. I think it, it is a bit of more of a learning curve if you want to do it with build uh, packs than with your Docker file. But I think as soon as you move to a reasonable structure of your Docker file and take care of security concerns, it, uh, the, the additional effort is well worth it. it. Actually becomes less and obviously be, would be worth it. So I, I agree with you, Liz. I think maybe having more examples on how to use build packs instead of Docker, especially right now with that whole discussion about software supply chain security. I think it perfectly hits there. Awesome. Well, hopefully this discussion can invigorate the project team to uh, to help come up with some of these examples. Awesome. Any yeah, other questions? I'll relay that to them. I will, oh, thank you. I will relay that to them and might make sure that those examples, if they do exist, that they're discoverable because that's typically the other challenge. Things yeah. exist, but people don't know how to get to them. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you, Andres. Any other questions about security tag? Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think it was really useful. Tag storage. Hello. Um, Hello, Alex. So, a, a bit of an update on the projects going through review. Um, the Longhorn project is um, the DD is is completed, um, and we've sent to Saad for review. He's he's provided a few comments back um, last night, uh, which we're just going through, um, but that should be done shortly. Um, Jaguar FS is about 70 odd percent um, complete. Uh, Rafael is is working on that. Um, we're, we're hoping to complete that um, soon as well. Um, open EBS. Um, there has been a bit of movement there. The, the, the team have been getting some of the um, licensing and copyright and a variety of other challenges um, sorted out, which they believe they've done now. Um, and they're going to, and we're going to pencil in a call with the team next week. Um, and then we'll be able to make a recommendation as to as to how to proceed there. 
Um, also, on on the project reviews, one one of the um, one of the things that Saad has asked us for is um, to 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 get guidance on how to deal with um, multiple uh, sort of multiple solutions um, and sort of trying to come up with a strategy for 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 how we decide and compare. Um, which ones should be incubated and graduated, whether you know it's all of them or some of them or or or, or how we differentiate with them. Um, so we're going to discuss that on the on the tag call tomorrow. Um, but also sort of um, I'd, I'd love to open it up to the floor if if there are any you know particular particular bits of feedback that the TOC could share there. Um, and then uh, finally, the we've been working on uh, a couple of documents the cloud native disaster recovery doc is is done um and uh and i think we're we're kind of ready to release that now and we have the performance and benchmarking white paper which which sort of had a bit of a stall for a few months um but now nick has picked this up and uh has reviewed the draft and we've got a final section to be finished off and and then I think we're we're done and it should be ready uh, in time for KubeCon. Um, and I think that covers it. Great, thank you. So I, I guess um, you asked for thoughts about, you know, how we deal with this situation of three kind of similar projects, you know, and how we evaluate the the three of the, I mean, for me, what I'd love to see is what is the difference between them? You know, what is the clear air that makes one different from another and that, you know, helps mm -hmm. helps us understand, you know, are there situations where we would want to recommend A and other situations where we would want to recommend B? And if there's another situation, if there's no situation where C is, is the best option, then I'm not sure why we would want all three, if that makes any sense. Well, so open question, um, you know, there's obviously each of the projects will have a variety of, you know, pros and cons, even if they solve similar problems. And certainly within the CNCF, we, we already have a lot of overlaps in, you know, different projects, whether it's, you know, runtime or observability or, or, or whatever else. And so the question is, you know, is it, should we be proposing like a recommendation to include or not include one or the other based on based on the fact that they have similar use cases or 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 should we or should we you know have multiple options like like we have in in sort of other technology areas of the cncf so i think wherever we have multiple options it's no bad thing to have multiple options. It's good to give people choice and we're trying not to be prescriptive and we're trying not to be kingmakers. But every time we have multiple solutions, it adds uh, some uncertainty for end users. And if, if that uncertainty is, is kind of unnecessary because in fact, no reasonable person would choose one of those three options given the other two, then, right. and I'm not saying that that's the case in, with these three, but you know, if if there were two that were definitely better than a third, then I would much rather that we don't try and pretend that all three are on the same level, if that makes sense. But it's very likely that all three have some strengths at which they excel or some environment where they're, they're best suited. And if that's the case, let's try and be as clear as we can to end users to sort of clarify why we think those three projects are worth sustaining and using. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. If anyone else has thoughts, please do chime in on that. That's just my kind of interpretation. Yeah, I, I, I like that, Les. Uh, what I was thinking, you know, similar to that was like, is there like a matrix of, okay, the, here are, these are the features and here are the projects. And so, you have a matrix where people can like figure out like, okay, based on these things, let me pick, let me start with one of these 
rather than the other ones, right? Uh, and then, it, you know, I'm just thinking like, what is the decision-making process for an end user to go through uh, these uh, projects? And you know, would they just pick one at random or can, can we give them some guidance like a, a like one page matrix saying here are the list of features or list of things that you need to look at. Here is where each of these uh, you know uh, storage options are useful. Um, you know, come up with something that will help them like pick the first one. Um, yeah. Um, hey Alex, I'm also wondering: Do these projects have any adoption stats of their own? Uh, you know, should CNCF? Uh, uh, have a have some kind of a, a common service or discipline that that tracks that because uh, you know it's one thing um, uh, for us to evaluate and recommend, but but I mean these projects have been growing on their own for a while, so they, they need to be able to demonstrate uh, some degree of adoption. Otherwise, I mean I think that I would I think that speaks more to the viability of the project than anything else uh, i i mean look i agree with that there there is there is sort of a um an implicit assumption that if the project passes a due diligence at incubation level that you know there are end users using it in production and, and adoption stats and maintainer stats and all of yeah but i think all, all, all the requirements there. are minimal right like three users or whatever so so if you know if if one had a millions of deployments, the other one has a thousand deployments, then then it's pretty obvious you know which one is really leading. So so that that's what I mean. Is there is there is there you, yeah. you, you, something like that would actually be very helpful from a, from a from an end user perspective? Another sort of um, more um, qualitative um, assessment might be asking those users why they picked the ones that they picked you know were they you know if they picked a was that because that was the one they were familiar with are there particular tendencies within one ecosystem to pick one solution over another you know I, we saw that with runtimes right that there were certain ecosystems that were more likely to use container d and others that were more likely to use cryo that kind of it, it becomes their valid choices and tend to go along with the ecosystem you're in um, well yeah i mean those are the kind of the, the the sort of things i was referring to right i mean you know assuming assuming um that there are always going to be some differences because obviously every product is is slightly different um and they're presumably going to have different um users we we seem to have, you know, like just off the top of my head, Container D and Cryo, or you know, Prometheus, Thanos, and Cortex, or you know, um, Linkerd and Envoy, um, all all have you know large large overlaps today. And the question is, you know, do we kind of standardize how we compare these things? Do we standardize how we provide guidance for these things? Or I mean, in, in some cases, maybe it's more clear cut than than others, I guess, but. Yeah, I think we're going to run out of time to um, fully flesh out that answer. Um, I do think if there are ways we can compare um, names, right? Tom has suggested about having metrics that we can compare performance metrics. I, I think I, I don't think that's the be all and end all. I do think if there are metrics, that would be useful. I guess this. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's something we can pick up in the next meeting. Yes, indeed. Let's um, put that on the agenda. Yeah. All right, in the last 30 seconds, I guess, uh, if anyone who is, pre I know most of the people who are um, sponsors for these are not on the call, but if anyone does have updates, please shout now. Amy, can, can we add the um, volcano to the list of they are under for projects waiting for sponsors? Yeah, we should probably try and put those. I, I know we can. I ran out of space into the meeting <laughs> units, but yeah, I ran out of Column space. Two. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think it's helpful if we make it prominent how many are waiting. Sure. 
<laughs> change that for next time that's fine all right. all right great thank you all right we're pretty much up to the top of the hour so um i think we probably have to call it a day but thank you everyone for your time and lots of really useful discussions today Bye, everyone. thanks everyone thank you Bye.